Hello and welcome to Open Up, a practical guide to improving pet oral health. This educational resource is brought to you by Hills Pet Nutrition, IM3, the veterinary dental company, with the expertise of the Australian Veterinary Dental Society. It has been estimated that over 80% of dogs and cats have some degree of periodontal disease by four years of age. In the USA, gingivitis and calculus are the most common disorders reported during clinical examinations. This was a finding from a national companion animal study of over 31,000 dogs and 13,000 cats. Periodontal disease can cause local infection and destruction of the oral tissues. But the release of inflammatory mediators and bacteria into the bloodstream has even more widespread health implications. Periodontal disease in man has been identified as a risk factor for coronary heart disease, stroke and preterm low birth weight babies. In dogs, it's been associated with pathological changes in the liver, kidneys and heart. The Australian Veterinary Dental Society aims to educate veterinary professionals as well as pet owners about the importance of oral health in our pets. In pursuit of this aim, the AVDS has produced a document entitled Canine and Feline Dental Guidelines. This resource is based on those guidelines. Periodontal disease often goes undetected by owners, yet it can be a chronic, painful and debilitating disease that can lead to reduced quality of life and even in some circumstances death. Periodontal disease can be prevented by combining a good home care program with regular oral examinations. Optimum home care would include daily toothbrushing and the use of clinically proven dental diets. Regular professional cleaning would also be an important part of the management of this disease. This resource has been produced to help you, the clinician, improve your skills in diagnosing and treating periodontal disease as well as other oral disease in your patients. This will help lead to better oral health and also improve quality of life for pets under your professional care. And that's what we all want. That's a good girl. All right, give me the ball. What's going on in there? You've got a bit of a stinky breath. You've got a bit of a stinky breath. We better check that out. That's a good girl. That's a good girl. Sit down, Sybil. Sit. Oh, good. Good girl. What's been happening in here? Let's have a look at your teeth today. Check if your teeth. Oh, oh my goodness. Look at that. Builder. Oh, that's not good. We'll ring the vet. Hi Hazel, how are you? Good, thank you, how are you? Good. I put Sybil in for her dental today. Okay, great. Right, thank, sure. thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to check Sybil out All before right. the vet comes in today. Is she having any trouble eating her food? No, not really. And what are you feeding her? Just dry food. Are you doing anything to help keep her teeth nice and clean? Oh no, I didn't know I had to. Okay, that's alright. What I'm going to do is just do a quick physical examination. So yes. I'm going to check her um, heart and her lungs and take a temperature as well. All right. And I'll also check her teeth over. Okay. And what I'll be doing is popping a stain to see if any plaque shows up. Oh good. I'll just go and let the vet know that you're here. Okay. Won't be long. Thank you. Hi Margaret. How are you going? Hi. I'm Christine Hawke. I'm the vet that's looking after Sybil today. Oh, thank you. Hello Sybil, how are you doing? She's a good girl. She's lovely, isn't she? Now Alicia was telling me that Sybil's got some oral disease. Oh, is that why she's got bad breath? It's the most likely reason. They get um, plaque bacteria building up on their teeth and that causes bad breath but it also causes periodontal disease. Oh, how do I get rid of it? Well, to get rid of the bad breath, you need to get rid of the plaque. So it's a combination of professional cleaning okay. and home care. And it's really important that you do follow up with care at home right. to keep the plaque down to stop the problem from recurring. Yeah. So what we need to do is have a good look at her mouth and um, check out what's happening. Just checking her lymph nodes. They 
feel fine. Good girl. Just have a look at your teeth and your gums. That's the girl. The other side. Good girl. That's it. You have a look at your tongue. Good girl. Okay. Well done. Well, Sybil's got quite a lot of plaque and tartar on her teeth, and so I think for her the best thing would be for her to be anaesthetised so that we can get a really full examination of what's happening and we can professionally clean off all of the plaque and tartar that's there at the moment. It also lets us find if there's any other disease there, and we may need to take some x-rays to do that as well. Uh, is that really necessary? Could I just start with the home care and see how we go with that? Yeah, not, it's probably not the best thing because the plaque and tartar that's already there won't be removed with home care. Oh. So what we'll need to do is get her mouth back to healthy and once it's healthy you can do things at home to maintain that. The other problem is is that if she has got gum, you know, she has got gum disease and it's painful, mm -hmm. if we start trying to brush her teeth at home then that could cause her some distress. Uh, I've heard that um, the gum disease can lead, lead to heart disease. Is that in dogs, is that right? Yeah, well, there's evidence in humans definitely that heart disease and gum disease are related. So um, in dogs the, the research is still ongoing, um, but there does appear to be links with kidney and, and liver disease as well in dogs. So, okay. so it's much better to treat it now before she gets problems than, well, than to wait. Okay, that makes sense to me. I, I want to do the best thing by Sybil. Okay, the other thing to let you know is that we may need to contact you through the day if we do find any other disease in her mouth while she's under the anaesthetic. Have you got any other questions? No, I think you've covered everything. Thank you. Great. Okay, well, Sybil, we'll go and get you ready for your operation. Okay. Once we have Sybil under general anaesthesia and we've thoroughly examined her oral cavity, we need to place a pharyngeal pack to protect her airway from fluid and debris. We can then apply plaque disclosing solution to make it easier for us to visualise the deposits on her teeth. What this solution does is to stain the plaque on her teeth a pink colour. So we simply paint the plaque disclosing solution onto the tooth surfaces making sure we cover all areas. And we rinse the excess off using a triplex. We can then remove any gross calculus deposits using calculus forceps or extraction forceps. Doing this will make examination of the teeth and ultrasonic scaling more effective. Next, we can use the periodontal probe to measure the depth of the gingival sulcus so we can detect any abnormal periodontal pockets. It's important to check the depth around the whole tooth. The normal probing depth for dogs is less than three millimetres and for cats is less than about a half to one millimetre. These probing depths can then be recorded on the dental chart. Any gingival recession or hyperplasia can also be recorded as this information helps us determine the degree of attachment loss. Once all findings have been recorded, you can review the chart and develop a treatment plan to address any abnormalities. You may also need to contact the client at this stage to obtain informed consent. Before scaling, we rinse the oral cavity with chlorhexidine solution, and this decreases the amount of bacteria that's aerosolised. So here we're using the ultrasonic scaler. We use the side of the scaler tip, not the point to remove plaque and calculus from the teeth. It's more efficient if you use a fairly light touch as using a lot of pressure will dampen the oscillations and make the job harder. It's also important not to spend more than about 10 seconds per tooth because you can overheat the tooth and damage the pulp. You can always go back to the tooth later to finish the job. 
Hand scalers are then used to remove any deposits that can't be effectively cleaned using the ultrasonic scaler. To protect the soft tissues from the ultrasonic scaler and to give yourself better visualisation of the back part of the mouth, you can always use a Minnesota retractor. It's also very important to gently scale under the gingival margin to remove any subgingival plaque and calculus from the gingival sulcus. For deeper periodontal pockets, we usually use hand curettes. Polishing removes any residual deposits and leaves a smooth surface that makes it harder for the plaque to reattach. Make sure there's always profi paste in the profi cup to avoid overheating the teeth. To polish subgingivally, you can flare the edge of the profi cup by applying pressure. Once all the teeth have been polished, use the triplex to irrigate and flush any remaining profi paste and debris from the gingival sulcus. Finally, check the oral cavity for any debris or fluid before removing the pharyngeal pack. Please refer to the supporting documentation for a step-by-step -step guide to this procedure. coped with the anaesthetic without a problem and we did her dental procedure um, and that went without any problems as well. Um, as I explained to you on the phone yesterday, um, she did have a few findings so we'll go through those again now. I've got her chart here. Um, she had quite a lot of tartar and, and plaque on her teeth and a fair amount of gingivitis. Mm -hmm. So what we've done with all of her teeth after we examined them was to scale and polish and get all of that off so that she can get back to a healthy mouth. Mm -hmm. um, the one finding we did have was that extra little tooth that we noticed. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we took that out. It was a very simple extraction and should heal very, very quickly. Um, the main reason we needed to take it out was because it was causing crowding with the rest of her teeth and so she was getting a lot of plaque build up. And so having that out of the way now will make keeping her, um, her major teeth in, a, in much better health a lot easier. So what do I need to do now? Well, now that we've got all the plaque off the teeth and we've got them back to a healthy state, it's up to you to try and keep as much plaque off at home as you can to slow down any more disease and the bad breath from coming back. So with um, anti-plaque products, there's a lot of things on the market. The two basic ways they work, one is mechanical, where you've got a product that removes the plaque from the teeth. Mm -hmm. And in humans, the main way we do that is toothbrushing, and we can certainly do that in our pets as well. Okay. Um, there's also special dental diets that are designed to clean the teeth as they oh. chew. Yeah, yeah. So um, with the chemical forms, it's like, in a person we would use mouthwash mm -hmm. so in dogs there are rinses and things that you can use as well I guess the main thing is because the plaque is a physical build-up on the teeth you want to mechanically remove it if you can yeah. so it's good if you can have at least one mechanical type of plaque removal yeah. and then you can use the chemicals to back that up that's the best way to control it so what sort of toothbrush and toothpaste should I use um, well, with toothbrushes, there are some that are designed for dogs and cats, um, and the main thing with them is that they're very, very soft. Uh -huh. When we brush our teeth, we can feel how hard it is on our gums, um, but with dogs, it's quite easy to press too hard. Uh -huh. So they're designed very, very soft. Um, they're also often designed to get up to the back of the mouth quite easily because their mouths are a lot longer than ours. Uh -huh. um, you can use human toothbrushes, but again, you'd go for the really soft ones. Uh -huh. So often the ones designed for children are really good for pets. Yeah. With toothpaste, um, the main thing is not to use human toothpaste because humans will rinse and spit whereas dogs will swallow anything oh. that you put in. Mm -hmm. um, and the amount of fluoride in human toothpaste is, can actually be toxic if they swallow a lot of it and it can upset their stomach. So um, they don't need fluoride as much as we do because they don't get as many problems with holes in their teeth and cavities mm -hmm. as we do. So the dog ones um, come in all different flavours too like chicken and beef and fish so um, you know strange as that sound it actually makes it easier yeah. to brush their teeth because they like the taste of it. Oh. The other thing to keep in mind is that there is an organisation called the Veterinary Oral Health Council yeah. and they put seals of approval on foods that are clinically proven and scientifically proven to control plaque and tartar mm -hmm. and the Hills Prescription Diet TD has been scientifically proven to do both of those things to control both plaque and tartar. Can I start feeding Sybil the food straight away? 
Well, like with any diet, it's better to transition it over a few days. So go from what you're feeding now straight over to the TD over a period of seven to 10 days. And that'll allow her to adapt to the new texture and the size of the kibble. Um, the good thing about this diet in particular is that it's a complete diet, so you can feed it just as the sole food. What about bones? Do they help with cleaning her teeth? Well, there's actually no scientific evidence that they do help control plaque. One of the things with bones that, that is a big problem is that a lot of dogs do break their teeth on them. So we do spend a lot of time taking out teeth that are otherwise healthy because they've been damaged by bones. They can also cause other problems like stomach upsets and obstructions and sometimes they can have bacteria in them as well that can make the dog quite sick. So a safer option, there are a lot of chew toys and treats out there that are probably a little bit safer for dogs. I will try the brushing and the dental food. It's good to know I can combine both because I'm not sure how easy it's going to be to clean Sybil's teeth. Yeah, no, I understand it's, it is quite difficult in some cases. It's not always as easy as we make it sound. The thing is that if you've got a, an animal that doesn't like it, really doesn't like it and is either being aggressive or whatever, the main thing is we don't want either of you to get injured. So if it's not working, that's when you would need to rely more on a dietary form of removing the plaque. Um, in her case, she's such a sweet dog and she seems to be very good about being handled around the mouth. I think if you can get it going and persevere with it, it's going to have enormous benefit for her. When do I need to bring Sybil back to see you? It'd be really good to see her in about four weeks time because that gives us time to see how you're going with the home care and, and with the brushing and the diet to see whether you are controlling the plaque quite well. The nurse will give you a call tomorrow um, to check how she's gone from the anaesthetic and when you're talking to her, she'll be able to give you a lot more tips on how to brush Sybil's teeth and how to transition the diet. I've got one more question. We've recently adopted a cat. She's 12 months old. Can I use the same dental food that I'm feeding Sybil? Um, not really because cats and dogs have got very nu different nutritional needs and so something that you feed to a dog won't actually meet all of a cat's requirements. The good news is that they do make the diet in both cat and dog forms so that you can get a different one for each of your pets. Uh, best thing to do before you start anything is to bring your cat in so that we can have a look and check how um, what condition the gums are in because depending on what's going on in the mouth will depend which type of diet we recommend. Okay, so I think that about covers it. Is there any other questions that you've got? No, I think you've covered everything. Excellent. Okay, well, we'll look forward to seeing you and Sybil again in four weeks. Great. See you then. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. I hope that you've enjoyed watching this educational resource and that it has been a worthwhile introduction into the world of veterinary dentistry. This resource has been produced to emphasise the importance of oral health in the overall health and well-being of our patients. All of the procedures and techniques shown here can be performed by you, the practitioner, with the assistance of your veterinary team. The take home message is that as practitioners, we need to recognise oral disease early, as well as informing our clients of ways to prevent our, or control this chronic disease. Whilst compliance can be challenging, there are a number of steps that can be taken to ensure better compliance for maintaining oral health. A good start would be to include the whole veterinary team from the receptionist through to the clinician. The team would stress the importance of prevention of oral disease by recommending number one, tooth brushing, two, the use of clinically proven dental diets and three, regular dental checkups. There are many ways to drive awareness of oral health in your practice, such as running a number of dentally focused promotions throughout the year. Don't forget to use a reminder system for clients to return for dental checkups, as your own dentist would do for you. Waiting room displays such as smile books and oral health product displays are also helpful. Watch your practice grow with the positive effect of your care and recognition of pets' special needs. I would like to draw your attention to a number of websites that will assist you in furthering your veterinary dental knowledge. Finally, I would like to thank the organisations that made this all possible. Hills Pet Nutrition, IM3, the veterinary dental company, the Australian Veterinary Dental Society and the University Veterinary Teaching Hospital, Sydney, 
at the University of Sydney where the procedures were performed.